and relax and prepare to be lifted up in consciousness, please help me welcome our own Reverend John the Beloved. Family, you raise me up. And you will pardon me if I tell you that I am just this close to the surface this morning. That was the song that the teenagers sang at my ordination. And every time I hear it, it just, it just fills my heart to the brim. So you may enjoy this encouragement in the overflow of my love and my emotions this morning. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. And just you sounded so wonderful when we were coming on stage uh, singing One Love. And the whole morning has just been alive with the, with the energy, the high energy of love and the presence and power of God. So welcome to you all. And I know some people, those of you that parted into the wee hours or sat up reading or whatever you're watching television, thank you for making the choice to still be here this morning to bless us with your presence and your consciousness and your love. Welcome. Welcome, too, to those who join us in consciousness, watch us on the World Wide Web, and find us on YouTube, and listen or watch. You're just, we're just one. One love, one heart, one, one amazing human family, and it's just such a privilege to be part of it and to share with you this morning. Um, I have another story for you from the University of Tower Street which is what I call the adult male correctional facility here in Kingston, the prison. Now, last month I told you about the learnings that came from an experiential exercise in which participants were asked to select an object and then describe what that object is saying about them and about their personality, what kind of ways you have, as we say in Jamaica. In that story I told you, a gentleman chose a stone for its strength and then deeply, I thought, suggested that there may be a vein of gold at the center of that seemingly rough stone, um, commonplace stone, and suggested that we might want to mine, to do some mining to find that vein of gold. And I was just so impressed at the, at the image of mining people to find the, the treasure that's within every single human heart. Well, the story doesn't end there. Every class, we start with an introduction, and then you know to get, it helps me to get to know them too. So they say an introduction, and then the whole class responds. So last week the the introduction was, "Hi, my name is Reverend John, and the spirit within me knows the truth of who I am," and that's a you know a pretty simple one. And the the response is, "Greetings, Godson. You are a beloved expression of Universal Mind." So. I went through it. I do it first so that they get it, and those who are, you know, are not so good with the reading and writing, they hear it, and so they can relate. But before we started, my hero of the, the rock stone with the vein of gold in the center said, can I say something? So I said, sure. He said, instead of being an expression of universal mind, could we say, might, once, might we say, is it possible to say, we are an extension of universal mind? Wow. I said, yes, that's wonderful. Please cross out expression and put extension. An extension like a sunbeam is an extension of the sun. We are extensions of that infinite intelligence which called all things into being. The story not done. I mean, I'm on tenterhooks when I'm in the class, you know, because you never know what's coming and from whom. So this time now, they had an experiential exercise. And it is, I give them crayons. And they have to, on a sheet of paper, draw little icons or emojis of how they think other people see them. You know, your mother see you one way, your girlfriend see you one way, the warders see you one way, your, 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 your cellmates see you another way, and so on. So they, get, they have great fun with it. You know, me can't draw, but me I got to try. And, you know, they, they, I said, don't write anything on it. Just draw the emojis. You will know what the foolishness mean. And then... The other part of the exercise is to turn the paper over to the clean side, and now you are allowed to write. And what you have to write is at least 10 responses to the question, who am I? So on the, the representational side, I go around and say, you know, um, how many you have, how many you have, how many you have, you know, and they tell me. When I got to my hero, he said, I haven't, I haven't put anything down. 
So I was dying to ask why, you know, but I don't want to preempt the class, so I just waited. And then when they turned over and I said, write 10 responses to the question, who am I? He picked up his pen and he started writing. So I thought to myself, okay, at least he's doing for me what is the more important part of the exercise, which is to, to reflect on his qualities and who he really is. The boy write one thing. <laughs> one word. I think it's three because I told him the head of the paper I am. He wrote one word. Can't wait to hear, but of course I have to contain myself because the next part of the exercise is to get into threes or fours, small groups, and share, first of all, see if you can guess what the, the various icons and emojis that you drew meant, and have great fun. And then to turn over your paper and share who you really are. So I, I'm, I'm allowing them to do that on their own without interfering, but of course my ears are peeled to the group that has my friend in it. He says, well, I never write anything, I never draw anything on the how people see me because how people see me is their business, not mine. <laughs> wow. Eh? -hey. So I, I can't wait to hear about this one word that's on the other side. He said, by the way, you know, too often we broke the ninth commandment. I've named my encouragement this morning, the Ninth Commandment. None of you get out your devices and Google it. And sh hands up, how many of you know what is the Ninth Commandment? Well, me never said because me couldn't quite remember myself. <laughs> and me, a pastor, is supposed to know. <laughs> I mean, I know that, but which is nine and which is eight and which, uh-uh. So I didn't say a word. <laughs> Turned over and how many of you can guess or can you guess what the one word is he wrote on the other side of the page. Near, I am spirit. And then he said to the group, I'm not in the group yet, you know, we haven't got back to plenary yet to share. He said, I am spirit, and after that, everything, everything that I am comes from that I am. Can we say I am spirit and everything that I am flows from that I am? Can we say that together? I am spirit and everything that I am flows from that I am. Wow. I said, wow, wow, wow. I was just blown away. Now, <laughs> I want to talk about this ninth commandment because normally, but I need to tell you what it is first, eh? The ninth commandment. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And that is said in a, as a response to an exercise where you are to indicate how you think other people see you. And here is someone of deep wisdom who is saying, what other, how other people see me is their concern. So we had a discussion, of course, and that it's important to know how other people see you or how you think other people see you because people treat you according to how they see you. So if you are seen by the water as being a troublemaker, you may get locked, locked down, as they call it, locked up in your cell, for asking what is a simple question wanting information. But if you're seeing as a, having an inquiring mind and being enlightened and a leader as they seem to see him, then any question from you is fine, even ones that sail very close to the, you know, the, the edge of the precipice in terms of being critical of the system and what the waters themselves are doing. So it is just wonderful that we could have that conversation about it really is no concern of yours. You're not to worry about how, the, how other people see you, but it's worthwhile knowing how you come across. And very often, too, we talk about, sometimes we come across how we don't want to. You know, so in his example of choosing the stone, you may come across as, as harsh or hard when really at the very center of that rock stone is a very soft and pure vein of gold. And if you want people to feel that and experience that, you may not want me to have to go to the, the exertion of mining for it, digging for it. Open it up and give me no. So we had that kind of conversation. It was wonderful. But that commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, normally is taken to mean, and rightly so, that we should not tell lies 
or spread rumors against other people, right? But listen to this bit of synchronicity. I found this in a book um, called The Heart of Mysticism by a, a, a metaphysical author known as Joel Goldsmith. Note the synchronicity of my finding an explanation of the Ninth Commandment written by a man named Goldsmith in response to a man a hundred years after his time, of Goldsmith's time, who, or nearly a hundred years, who thinks, why don't you take the trouble to find out that the vein of gold is within me? Goldsmith mining for the gold in somebody incarcerated in the, in the general penitentiary on Tower Street in Kingston, Jamaica, on a life sentence. A vein of gold in someone that society perhaps may have forgotten, ha have rejected, and certainly wouldn't want to associate with. Necessarily. So Goldsmith explains about this ninth commandment, which my hero brought to my attention last week, Tuesday. And here's what Goldsmith says. Even to say that your neighbor is good and healthy is to bear false witness against him. Because by doing so, you are holding him as a limited, finite human being who was born and will die, who may be good today and bad tomorrow. Obedience to the ninth commandment is to understand that your neighbor is immortal and eternal, possessing only the qualities of God, which are spiritual. End of quote. So the, what Goldsmith is saying is we have to stop labeling. You know, friends, we have to stop talking about gunmen. You know, so much. Something that you do is not who you are. So we have to stop putting labels on people. And Goldsmith is making it, stretches your mind, to stop even saying something is good or bad. Stop judging, stop comparing, and just take it as information. And if we begin to look at people through the eyes of God and to see the godness and the goodness in them, it changes your whole perspective, your whole aspect of life, your whole approach to people, the whole way that you interact. It changes your language. It changes your conversations. It helps you to experience God. Wow. Just imagine going through your life experiencing God in every single person you meet. God being glamorous like Lorna Phillips on the platform telling you about the, the, um, the Thriving Ministry Initiative. God being John, you know, outrageous and unpredictable. God being however you show up, it's God. Can you just say, oh my God? Turn to your neighbor and say, oh my God. Oh my God. My friends, in God, there are no opposites. In God, there are no opposites. The psalmist writes in Psalm 139, verse 12, the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. There are no opposites in God. There is no good and then not good. There can be nothing opposed to God. And so when the people tell you that the, the enemy, as sometimes it's referred to, or, you know, the devil, the devil made me do it. Did I tell you the story about the pastor's wife who bought the dress for a fortune? Yes, I did. When she got home, she took out the dress and I was hanging it up and he said, darling, I thought we made a New Year's resolution that you're not going to do any shopping this year for any more clothes. You have two cupboards full and I'm having to move out my suits out of my cupboard so you can have more space. All of the ladies in the audience who that applies to, hug it up. She said, she said, yes, darling, but I passed this dress and it just called out to me. He said, yes, I know how that goes, but you know we agreed what you should say. Get thee behind me, Satan. She said, I found myself at the cashier with the credit card in my hand. And I said, get thee behind me, Satan. And said, look, dear, I'm good on you from behind, too. <laughs> 
there are no opposites, my friends. There is only God. Only God, trust me. So we can stop dining out on that business of good and bad, good and evil. This is, this is all right, but this is not all right because it fits our paradigm. And then when you get to that point, you know, you stop then trying to get other people to be how you want them to be. So, you know, I always tell my, my, my brides to be in, in the counseling about the story of the bride who was really very nervous about her wedding day. And so she said um, to the pastor, I'm so nervous, I know how I'm going to get through this. He said, it's okay, man, I'll guide you, don't worry yourself. When you get out of the car at the, you know, under the, at the entrance, um, and you, you'll be at the door, there'll be a buzz in the church, you know, and everybody will be, ah, she's here. But you just focus on the aisle. Just look at the aisle and keep your focus on the aisle. And then as you come up the aisle and you, I'll be standing there waiting for you, focus your attention on the altar so that you, 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 your focus is always on something ahead of you. And I'll announce the first hymn and then you just make certain you have your program and that you begin by, by singing the first hymn with us and it'll calm you down. So that is your, that is your, your formula. First the aisle, then the altar, and then the, first, the opening hymn. So she gets to the door on the wedding day, and as she predicted, she was really nervous. And so she stood there and she said, oh, his pastor said, aisle, aisle, altar, him. I'll alter him. I'll alter him. So. That which is God, my friends, is infinite and eternal. And that is indeed who you are. You are an invisible spiritual being. So this is just the clothes you have on. Your body is just today's outfit, this lifetime's outfit. It's the vehicle, if you prefer, of, that you are using on this plane of existence. But you are in and of God. God constitutes your individual identity, and even though you may sometimes forget and permit your actions to belie that truth, nevertheless, that does not change the truth that in essence and identity and being, you are, as my friend said, an extension of God. I love that. I have stopped saying expression. I am more than an expression of God. I am an extension of God. I am in the microcosm what God is in the macro. I am a small version of that amazing presence and power that flung the stars into the farthest reaches of the universe and hung the sun and the moon and that made it the sunrise this morning and made the choir sing so beautifully and all of you just radiating the energy. That's God. Isn't that just so exciting? That we are God expressing God to the honor and glory of this amazing presence and power that holds the entire universe in place. Goldsmith writes, if you become still until you arrive at a state of spiritual realization, you will see me as I am, spiritual, complete, and perfect. And you say to your neighbor, I see you as you are, spiritual, complete, and perfect. I see you as you are, spiritual, gorgeous, complete, and perfect. I see you as you are, spiritual, complete, and perfect. <laughs> So that implication, you know, is, hello, Mr. Dindy, but that is supposed to be Lorna. Where you, you cross the aisle? <laughs> yes. So if God is love, you are an extension of love. If God is peace, you're an extension of peace. If God is beauty, you're an extension of beauty. Give me some more. God is whole and holy and wholesome. You are an extension of that perfection. Perfect God, perfect person, perfect expression. Hmm? God is abundance. God is thriving. So what is the truth about you? I am. I'm abundant. I'm thriving. Uh, yes. Peace. Calm. Yes. You are an extension of that calm. So you don't need to, to tear your hair and to get, to get frantic. 
Just say I am an extension of that which created me out of itself. And you know, a basic spiritual principle is that there is only oneness. And so if those of us that are, are for example, on our, on our goal setting this year, wanted to find the right perfect partner, rather than, than finding the right person, we need to be the right person. And trust me, it just shifts the whole, the whole energy of what you are, you are seeking. Though like it or not, you are one with every single person you encounter. And you know, I've learned, and this is a, this is a, a, a big frog to swallow, but you see when I react negatively to someone, as we say in Jamaica, my spirit not take them, I need to look inside myself. It is a wake up call for me to look for what is it in my consciousness that makes them press my button because they pressed the button but they didn't install it. <laughs> I installed the button and therefore I can deactivate it so that I don't allow other people to dictate how I live my life and how I express the love that I am an extension of. When you accept this higher image of yourself, my friends, when you relate to others from the awareness that you are a spiritual being, you no longer relate to yourself as a creature with whose satisfaction is derived from, solely from physical pleasure and from the world being how you think it should be. You stop relating to others in terms of their physical appearance or their behavior and are able to express respect, kindness, love, and compassion for everyone. For everyone. It's, it's such a, a, a liberating concept that you no longer are, are put off by how other people present themselves, how other extensions of God show up in their uniqueness and their, their differentness and their diversity. Because you can say, it's all God. I see it as purely God in extension. So I'm not saying, you know, that, that if you are loving and accepting and you, never ex that you, you see God in everything and everyone, that you're never going to experience difficulties in relationships. You will get angry sometimes with people and they get angry with you. And you may be in a relationship which calls for you to take away yourself, as we say in Jamaica, because it's not working for you. But even when that's hap that happens, and both of you need to seek professional help, maybe, or whatever, you can still see the person, not their behavior, not what they have done and how they have hurt you. You can still see them through the eyes of spirit. You can still see them as God sees them. So I have an assignment for you this week. And the assignment, yes, it's about, you know, about um, seeing people through the eyes of God, but it's a little further than that. Years ago, um, when I first started coming to this church, 1981, 82, uh, my friend Larry Chang, who brought me here, and myself, used to go home after service on a Sunday to his house for coffee, in his case, tea, and we would talk about what Reverend Elmer had had shared that morning, you know. And you know, sometimes when we, when we talk in this, in this new thought jargon that we use sometimes, you know, our godness and, you know, I am knowing the good of God for you. And I'm saying, oh, who says I am knowing? How peculiar, you know. So we go home and discuss this. This particular Sunday, uh, Dr. Elmer gave us a, a, a really powerful exercise. Well, it's really, really a, a test. And the test was that before you repeat anything you are told, and remember those days we never had WhatsApp and WhatsApp groups and Twitter, Bitter and Sitter, um, <laughs> but we did have telephone and uh, email still and all of that. She said, before you repeat anything, make certain that your speech passes through three golden gates. And there's a poem called Three Gates, which I'd like to share with you, which explains this formula. If you are tempted to reveal a tale to you someone has told about another, make it pass before you speak three gates of gold. These narrow gates. First, is it true? Then, is it needful? 
In your mind, give truthful answer. And the next is last and narrowest. Is it kind? And if to reach your lips at last it passes through these gateways three, then you may tell the tale, nor fear what the result of speech may be. Is it true? Is it necessary? Is it needful to repeat it? And is it kind? But you see, when Larry and myself got home that day after church, and we sit down with a cup of coffee and a cup of tea, I said, by the way, did I say, oh, no, never mind. <laughs> and he said, well, you know, I'm glad you're, you, um, you're here because I wanted to, oh, no, never mind. <laughs> you would be amazed at how much of the negative we seem to want to pass on. And I see it in the WhatsApp, too. You know, you get, you get warnings and p pictures of people picking locks and ABMs. It's happening in Timbuktu. And I say, but this place don't look like Jamaica. It's not. You know. So before you pass on any kind of news about anything this week, is it true? Is it necessary? And is it kind? And it will then become a litmus test for you of what you, 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 you may want to be sharing with other people. Does that make sense? Yes. So my friends, when we bear false witness or choose to distance ourselves from others, our lives become discordant. We, we begin to sing out of tune with God's music. And when we decide to see the divine in everyone and to respond lovingly, no matter how the other person treats us, we create celestial music, beautiful music. God, my friends, is the songwriter of your song, and your job is purely to allow the celestial music to resonate in all your relationships. And speaking of God's music, Practitioner Steve Goulding is now going to connect all our hearts with a beautiful song titled, There is a Man, that came through him. Stevie? Let's give him a welcome. In. Well, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. That's a nice word. <laughs> Morning, church. There is a man who walks this land and he teaches we are all one. We must learn how to live and love and to understand. One day this man took me by the hand and he showed me who's my neighbor. I am learning how to live and love and to understand. I soared all oh so high, the whole world seemed at peace. The color of us all a beautiful hue. Then it came time for me to be released. In my heart, that color became my view. Of this lovely land where we live as one, I know that all that lives is my neighbor. I am learning how to live and love and to understand. Your dance dances are right enough. I can dance. I soared oh so high, the whole world seemed at peace. The color of us all a beautiful hue. Then it came time for me to be released. In my heart, that color became my view. Of this lovely land where we live as one, I know that all that lives is my neighbor. I am learning how to live and love and to understand. We must learn how to live and love. Let us learn how to live and love. We must learn how to live and love and to understand.
We must learn how to live and love and to understand. Yes, Stevie, thank you. That's, that's a blessing. An extension of God's music. There's nothing more to be said, but just God bless you all. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you, Stevie.